Oh, my Lord, what have I just done? What have I just done? And the Lord said, Steve, you've done the right thing. I'll take care of it from here. You see, the old devil wants to come along, and he cannot get in in our minds, but he can use our doubts. May I say this? Satan is not omnipresent. All right? He's not omnipotent. He is limited. He cannot get in your brain, but he can figure out what your doubts are and use them against you. And as I laid on that bed and I had my doubts, the Holy Spirit just came along and said, Listen, folks. Listen, son. You've done the right thing. I'll take care of it from here. But oh, how we wonder about falling backwards. No. We have the victory. And in verse 12, we see that there was great rejoicing in heaven because Satan was thrown out of heaven. But listen, that becomes a woe here on earth because guess what? Our enemy is now here. Right? Can I say this to you with all the courage that I could muster in your heart right now? There's an old saying, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. By the way, you don't have to worry about that because the enemy is close to you, boys and girls. Every once in a while, throw him an elbow, punch him in the face, kick him in the shins, all right? Throw a chain around his neck, remind him, baby, you are doomed. I got a home in glory land. You are doomed. And so that great voice tells us that there is a woe here on earth. The Bible says that there is a great flood, that this dragon, the serpent, throws out at the woman who gave birth to the son. And that great multitude of his army is going to go out after anybody who names the name of Christ. You see, the old devil has got a bloody nose. I don't know the last time you've watched a boxing match. I kind of enjoy watching this stuff. Even Lynn, I've got Lynn kind of interested in it as well. But sure enough, you get out there in the ring and you pop your opponent in the face and it kind of makes him spin. He's all the madder. He is all the more angry. And the, the devil's nose has been bloodied. And now he is after us. On Wednesday night, when we were studying Genesis chapter 27... We saw that where Isaac was supposedly on his deathbed, and he said this, he says, my days are numbered. And he told Esau to go out and get him wild game that he might have one last meal and give him a blessing. Listen, the same motive is here. The old Isaac didn't know how many days he still had left, but he wanted to get some business done before he left. Satan has numbered days. His days are short. He doesn't know how long it may be before he's finished, so he wants to do as much damage as possible. I'll give you some earthly advice. Never buy a repossessed car. These people who get their cars repossessed think that they can go and just trash them completely before they get picked back up. Okay, It's the wrong kind of car to to buy, okay? Listen, in essence, Satan has got an eviction notice. And what he wants to do is do as much damage as he can before he's taken out of this world. And Sherry, you guys rent property and you know what happens, right? Right? People just trash things. Listen, be careful. Satan has that same motive, that he knows his days are limited. He's going to try to trash this place before he's finally locked up in the old place called hell. He's going to do as much damage as possible. In uh, Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, we read this. Daniel saw from the Spirit of God, heard from the Spirit of God, a time of trouble such as never was is coming your way. In verse 13, there is persecution of the woman who gave birth. And I, before last week I told you this, um, uh, that I picture that this woman is Israel who gave birth to Christ. Christ gives birth to the church. And here we see that the woman is told to flee in verse 14. When she flees, the Bible says that she has been given wings. Look at verse 14. Two wings of a great eagle that she might escape out into the wilderness to her place. And she'll be nourished 
for times, times and a half time, time, times and a half a time uh, in the presence of the serpent. May I say this, that there is something fantastic about the country of Israel. But before we get there, I want to say this. Sometimes people take this passage of Scripture and interpolate that this is America because our um, mascot is a great eagle. I will say this to you. Please come back to reality. And that is that the Nazi Germany also had a great eagle as their mascot. We can't interpret countries into this. Rather, let's use the Bible as its own commentator. Ready? Here it comes. In Exodus chapter 19, we are told this, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you, Israel, on eagles' wings. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, Isaiah 40 uh, verse 31, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. We don't know how Israel would be delivered during this period of time, but we know that as if they were on eagle's wings, they would be moved away and protected from the serpent. It may be by the means of another country like uh, America, uh, but nonetheless, we see that this is intervention um, by a supernatural uh, means. God supplies food and water and clothing and shelter and protection just like he did in Exodus. Elijah was told to go to the brook and drink water from it and the ravens brought him bread and meat every day. Uh, some people propose that maybe this is Petra uh, in the Holy Land. I want to go see that. I saw some slides of it this week. Beautiful place. I want to remind you that God is faithful to his people and his covenant. In Isaiah chapter 49, a woman can forget her nursing child, but God will never forget Israel. In Jeremiah 31, if the sun and the moon and the stars stop shining and the ocean waves stop moving, and if someone could measure the heavens, God would still not forget Israel. Romans chapter 11, God has not cast away Israel. God's gifts to Israel, his covenant, his word, his lands, these are all irrevocable. I put in the bulletin that uh, Israel, uh, the indestructible Jew, even though in verse, uh, and and, excuse me, in Exodus, we see that Pharaoh is trying to kill the baby children, uh, uh, the baby boys in Exodus chapter 14, the Red Sea could not drown the Jews. In Esther, um, uh, Haman's vengeance could not hang them on a gallow. In Jonah, Uh, The great fish could not digest the Jew. In Daniel, the fiery furnace could not burn him. In Daniel chapter 6, the lions could not devour him. In Numbers chapter 23, Babylon, uh, excuse me, uh, Balaam, the prophet for prophet could not curse him. In Esther, the nations could not assimilate him. In Isaiah chapter 14, the dictators of the nations could not annihilate him. The Jew is indestructible. Because God's promises on them are irrevocable. May I go on to say this. The Bible is telling us that now, look at verse 17, that not only is the dragon after the woman, listen, but also her offspring. And I want to jump ahead and I want to kind of close this out and say this. That these are the ones who keep God's commandments and the testimony of Jesus Christ. May I say this, when the Bible in verse 17 uses the terminology that the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring, the rest of her offspring, as Israel brought forth Jesus Christ through the Virgin Mary, also Israel was somewhat the birthplace of the church. And now we're here. And this represents the church that Satan is so honked off at that he's also after us. Can I say this? Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. uh, Jesus said to Peter, Satan desires to sift you. He wants to grind you in fine powder. I mentioned that last Sunday. Um, The greatest place that I could ever tell you to turn to as a follow-up from this morning's sermon is this. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying. Listen to some of his words. I pray for them. Keep through your name those whom you have given me. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. I'm going to pause in that prayer right now. 
way back yonder in Matthew chapter 16, when Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, the fulfillment of the whole Old Testament, he said, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall never prevail against it. In Acts chapter 2, Peter gets up to preach. He's only using the Old Testament. The New Testament was not even put together yet. There's enough Old Testament passages to point to Jesus Christ. And when Peter preached, the Bible says, and the Lord added to the church. First time we ever see that word. You see, Jesus knew that out of this background, the church would be born and Satan would be our enemy until we're all home safe. Now, I want to continue what Jesus prayed in that prayer. Listen to it. Keep them from the evil one, that they all may be one in us, that they may be one just as we are one, that they may be made perfect in one, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. That's the greatest prayer Jesus ever prayed, John chapter 17. Let me bring this to a close. Are you ready for this? We are Christ's body here on earth. He has called us to be one in them. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's told us that he wants to keep us from the evil one. But as you see in my outline, I threw this scripture out. It's Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16 that we are described as having the armor of God. And then all of a sudden, in verse 16, it's describing Satan as firing, a shooting fiery darts at us. Certainly. You ready for this? Certainly. If we've got fiery darts coming our way, there should be no room for any friendly fire. We just don't need it, do we? That when Jesus prayed for the unity of a church, of the church, that he was saying, Lord, may they be one in us like we are one.